Good day, Patty. Thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself, tell us where you live and work, what you do, and perhaps some of the more interesting things you've worked on in your career? Sure, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks a whole bunch for having me. Uh, my name's Patty Shank, and I live in Denver, Colorado. If I didn't have a cold, um, you would be able to tell that I'm not from Denver, Colorado, so I'll leave that for, to you to try to figure out where, what my accent is. Um, but I've lived in Denver for about 20 years, um, and I absolutely love living there. Um, what I'm doing right now, for the most part, is studying studying what the science of learning, the science of information design, the science of um, training, delivery, there's, there's all science, kinds of sciences including cognitive science and a new one, informing science, that I've been reading lately, tell us we should be doing to make it easier for people to learn and then taking what is often very verbose and difficult language and trying to figure out what are the two or three gems you can pull from that um, and use every day um, in every everyday training and performance um, solutions. So how did you get started in all this? What's your career history? I've done a million things. My background's mostly business, um, which is why the business analytics part of some, some of uh, performance technology and performance analysis made total sense to me. Being able to measure and quantify things, I love that. In fact, I drive people crazy with quantifying things they don't think ought to be quantified. Um, so, most of what I do right now is is reading, reading the science and then trying to make some sense out of it, um, and then put it in some very applicable term, terms like. Um, some people will say we need to do more spaced learning. Well, what does that mean? Well, you could read 25 articles and it's very in depth, but what are the three things you can take out of that that we can do every day in the workplace to help people remember? Um, and remind me later if I forget this, um, one, of, one of the issues that people have with me right now is the issue of remembering. There seems to be this thing right now where people think, we don't need to remember anything. We can look it up on the Google. Right. Um, and that's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So so if I don't bring that up and maybe bring me around to that again because because it's right up there with some of my other pet peeves. It's like, oh no, we don't need to remember anything. Well that's that's great. Mm -hmm. Except it's not that's so. <laughs> well how what where did your career start now? I know you had a very uh, different start in your career from the training profession or instructional design profession? Well, the, the very first real job I had out of college was running an optical store. Um, I, was, I was going through a divorce and um, I didn't have any real job skills, so I asked my soon-to-be ex-husband if I could spend a year in some kind of healthcare thing, because um, I I had a vision then that that would be a job that, that we could all have forever. Um, and it is actually, and something I still participate in um, tangentially. And I, I, I fit contact, I was an optician. Um, and I fit contact lenses and I fit glasses and I made glasses and worked with uh, optometrists. And um, it was one of the most fun things I've ever done. And I like it so much that I've thought that when I retire, I might go back and do it again because it's really <laughs> darn fun. It just doesn't pay well. Mm -hmm. So the, how did that then lead to, I don't know, where your PhD came in as uh, part of this and how you got into the training biz? Really, really long um, way to get from there to here, but in, in a nutshell, I just wasn't making enough money um, to support myself as an optician, even though I liked it. So somebody who came in and sold products to me asked if I would consider being, being a sales rep. Um, and I became a sales rep for an ophthalmic company um, and over time ended up as, as their uh, anatomy and physiology and, and, and how the body works kind of trainer. Mm -hmm. um, and working with other people in the field so that they understood how products actually worked. Um, and I traveled around and did that and I loved it. I liked it even more than being an optician. <laughs> and then they told me something that just 
wrecked my day and it was that being, being a trainer was the next step to being a district manager. And, and the answer was not just no, but hell no. <laughs> so I got my first real job as a real trainer. I was the first trainer hired in to a um, HMO and um, started designing their, their operations training um, because uh, they had none. They had never done training. And then we brought on um, another operations trainer and um, I started doing leadership and management development which I enjoyed a whole lot and then they, we brought in um, health education which is my one of my backgrounds I have a health education background and, and we started running that and we ran a conference center and that was fabulous too it's just a great job um, and then my my husband told me he wanted to move to Denver Colorado and I started working for myself. Um, and I did it because I had um, a kid at home and he needed mama to be there after school and working 7 a.m. till 6 p.m. each night was really tough. So I just stayed home and started doing contract training work. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized during that time that, that um, I didn't know enough, um, that there were problems coming to me in my day-to-day -day work that I didn't feel were training problems but but they were certainly related mm -hmm. um, so I needed more so I ended up with a master's degree in instructional technology from George Washington University and then later on a PhD in um, I forgot what they even call that PhD program. It's kind of a general PhD in education, and you you narrow it down for yourself mm -hmm. um, at the University of Colorado. And all of those were really good experiences. But um, people talk about. I, I I had a conversation with someone recently, and they said, "Well, what do we do with all these subject matter experts who think they're trainers?" And here was my response. Kind of, we all were exactly that, you know. Um, so I think we we I know this isn't probably a popular thing to say, but I don't think we hog training and performance interventions for ourselves. Um, we become a bottleneck when we do, and we train them how to do this job better, just like we learned how to do the job better and we make them into performance analysts and training designers and whatever because information's flowing so fast these days that we can't afford to be a bottleneck in organizations. We're a bottleneck in other ways. We can't be, we, people have to be able to get information and interventions out um, without having everything they need. They have to be much more agile. Let's segue into your first exposure to human performance technology, HPT, or, or whatever you call it. I call it that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's interesting that this happened this way, because I certainly wouldn't be here now talking about this if it hadn't. I was looking in my, in my job as the manager of training for the HMO for what do you do with things that, that training either won't help or will help but won't help all by, by themselves and I, I ran across a, a, a workshop being given by Gary Rumler. I didn't know who he was. I don't think he was real, real famous back then um, and I think it was a precursor to uh, managing the white space book mm -hmm. which has been like a bible to me and talking about um, job level, process level, organization level, and it gave me, I remember sitting in there and getting goosebumps because he gave me specific tools I could use to figure out what was going on, and I've used those tools. I don't, I don't still have the books that he gave us, but I've been using those tools in everything I do since then, even when I don't call it, I, I tend to not call it performance technology or performance analysis, I just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that's when it started for me and I was, I, I found that the tools he gave me in that workshop made my, 
career trajectory much different than it would have. I wasn't designing just just training anymore. I was looking for why. Mm -hmm. Why is this happening? So when, and this is, people will relate to this because everybody's had this. Can you train my people to be nice? <laughs> that, that's, my, that's my favorite one. Train them to be nice. Um, to, it, to which um, I wanted to say, how about we just hire nice people <laughs> and train them to do the job mm -hmm. instead of training people who are curmudgeonly or, or angry or whatever and training them both to be nice because we're not going to train people to be nice mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, exactly. so, so, I mean, I knew that from taking his workshop and from working in that organization for as long as I did. Excellent. Thank you. So, were there other uh, big HPT influences back then that uh, all, and can you name the, any people or articles or books sure. for our audience? I mean, Joe Harless for it? sure, mm -hmm. um, and, and um, Thomas Gilbert, Six Boxes, mm -hmm. um, that, gave, that gave me a picture to give people. It's mm -hmm. like, well, let's talk about these things, where do we think this is going, where do we think we should be looking for some of the problems? Um, and I've, I, I've played with the six boxes, I've renamed them, I've added boxes, taken boxes away, mm -hmm. um, but, but I still use it to this day and that one, that one has stayed with me, Pro probably the, the Rumler um, tool set and, and the six boxes have stayed with me through everything I do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? Well, I actually wrote this recently because when I tell people what I do, no one understands it. <laughs> so so here, here's what I say to people, that, that what I do now is would help people figure out what problems they're actually having and what scientifically driven performance interventions are most likely to to help that those problems, and then apply measurement both before and after to see to see if we're having an impact, and if not, what what do we need to do next? I I tend to sort of prototype that just the same way that mm -hmm. you do because people, you know, I, one of the things about you that I've always admired is that you actually spend your work quantifying problems, quantifying tasks. And I've never found anyone who is willing to spend the money for that. <laughs> so, so I really just like the answer was just, no, we're not going to do that. Just fix it. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to learn, and you've seen them in, in some of my books too, some um, quick and dirty ways of getting information quickly, prototyping, see if, you know, and, and measuring how does this work? Is it, is it going to be helpful or not? Um, so, so the biggest thing that I do is, is apply scientifically driven training, performance, information design, um, usability, all of those um, principles which all come from evidence um, or research to, to whatever problems we find. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it fills my evidence bucket up and then my evidence bucket fills my writing up. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's a good segue into my next question is that, is there a current focus that you have or your next focus for learning and or writing? I believe you're working on another book here, but, but you seem to have your hand in many different topic areas for right. research and, and uh, writing. Well, I do a number of things. One of the things I do is, is I listen and read to see what people are talking about that probably needs a more of an evidence-based focus. Like for instance, my latest article on e-learning industry is about video and engagement. And I, you know, I love it because what people are saying and thinking about make, I don't have an opinion until I read the research. I mean, I have an opinion, but mm -hmm. it's, it's uninformed and probably stupid. Um, and then I read the research and go, oh. So I, I love doing that. So I hear people saying the word engagement and video. We got to do more in video. And, and so I started, what are people saying about video? Well, 
one of the things I said in that article is that video is impactful because people remember 95% of what they, what they see. Um, and it's like, yeah, I don't think that's so because we don't remember 95%. We might remember a fair amount of something that's very emotional, um, whatever, you know, but, but we see a video so we automatically remember 95% because it has pictures. Um, so I, I read, I, I reread on the picture superiority effect, um, and then that research that I talked about about video to me had had. I mean, there were so many people, so many views of those videos that I thought they probably got some pretty good ahas there, and some of the ahas kind of floored me. I always thought talking head video was probably not so impactful. Um, turns out that for instructional video, having the instructor occasionally on there talking humanly and in his own language and with passion um, made a difference in how long people were willing to watch a video. Mm -hmm. Who knew? I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so, so that's how I get my article ideas. I never know where they're going to come from. I'm just listening or I'm reading something and I'm thinking, well, this is fascinating. So, um, you know, that, that's one thing I do. Try, try to do an article for e-learning industry every month. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm rewriting, or not rewriting, I'm updating the writing and organizing book okay. because there's some stuff left out. Now, there's stuff left out of all of those books because I try to condense things. Mm -hmm. But there's some things on writing instructions um, and how to write for for digital that I left out of the first one and that and they need to be in there so I'll probably take some stuff out and put put that back in um, so I'm going to rewrite that within or update it within the next I hope three to four months tell our audience a little bit about this book series that you've got and w what the names of the current books are and where you're going with the series Got it. So the the series is Deep Learning, the Deep Learning series. It's on Amazon only, um, and I'm self-publishing with Amazon and have learned a ton about self-publishing. Mostly how to not how to how to do it wrong and then fix it. Um, but but we're, I've written three books. I picked two specific instructional workplace learning instructional issues that I thought needed to be addressed because they're problematic everywhere. One is on how to write and organize learning and the other one is on practice and feedback. And I'd, I'd seen problems. I see that that many instructional designers, trainers, whatever, subject matter experts, don't know how to write, much less write for instruction. So clarity is really, and comprehension, if you can't comprehend, you can't learn. So I set out to answer the question is, are there very specific guidelines on how to write for instruction? It turns out there are, um, and I found them and wrote about them. And um, I think that particular book, Writing and, Write and Organize for Deeper Learning, will probably be updated regularly mm -hmm. um, as, as I learn new things. Um, and it may end up being bigger than just two. I, my goal was to make each one of them about 200 pages mm -hmm. um, because you get longer than that and people are just not going to read it. But, but we'll see. We'll see where it ends up. I don't know. Um, and so I'm updating that one now. Practice and feedback, the problem with that is it often is missing. Yes. Just missing. Gone. Just like not there. <laughs> so so um, We told you. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's, it, it's like so, so the question was, what does the research say about the importance of practice um, and feedback to learning? And it's pretty much don't, bo don't bother if you're not going to do practice and feedback um, because that's where it, it makes it into long-term memory, which I'll be talking about um, tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that became, and, and the third book was I kept running into questions that all had similar issues around, well, why can't we do this and why can't we do that? 
And so I just started studying how is it how is it that our memory learns and then holds on to things, mm -hmm. remembers, um, and how do we design for that? Um, and I had pieces of it, but I didn't have it all. So I started reading all about that, and most of that came from cognitive science. And um, so the third book, um, Managing Memory, um, is just what are the problems that we go through when we're trying to learn and then trying to remember so that we can apply later. Because it's, it, it's learn, remember, apply, and you're not going to apply if you don't remember. Now, you, you may not have to remember everything. You may be able to look certain things up, mm -hmm. but you can't look everything up because it would take you all day to look everything up you needed in order to do something. So you, there are things you have to remember in order to know, to understand what it is you've looked up or to remember how to do something without having to look up every piece of it. And, and let's face it, you just can't. Mm -hmm. um, expertise is all about remembering. So, so um, that's the third book. Um, and so they're doing really well. I, I would like to do a fourth book, and it's what the research says about using digital media. Okay. Um, I've pulled together the research. I've started reading it. Um, one of the things that's slowing me down is that you don't get paid while you're doing the research. Right. You don't get paid while, while you're analyzing the research. You don't get paid while you're writing, and those are very long time periods. Mm -hmm. And then you write and you hope the books will, will sell. Um, I, I, here's what I've learned. I've learned that you either need a Kickstarter campaign or something. Will Tallheimer, by the way, mm -hmm. his book w was um, um, underwritten by a group of people who ha who helped him. Mm -hmm. Now it still wasn't enough money, but he made more off that Kickstarter um, than I've probably made on, on any of the three books. So I'm holding back to see whether I can afford to actually <laughs> do this. Mm -hmm. I wish to do this. I have the research. Um, it's probably a six to nine months project without pay, so you don't know yet. Exactly. Um, so, so the thing I'm doing that may finance that for me is a bunch of people have asked me in the last three to six months, um, can I train their organizations in some of this? Mm -hmm. Because a book isn't training. Right. Um, and so giving people feedback on things um, as they're writing, as they're picking practice activities. And um, because travel's a little bit hard for me, I've got chronic migraine, um, traveling a ton is just not the right option for me. So I finally, in the last three to four weeks, have pulled together what I'm going to use for a training system um, and do a, some kind of a blended um, solution, blended not meaning face to face and in person, but blended meaning using different modalities, mm -hmm. um, so that 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 we can do that. So um, I hope to be working with Karen Hyder on that, um, one of my favorite people in our field. Period. Um, so we'll see. I, I don't have an answer yet. Um, I'm still playing. Well, I'm looking forward to this uh, this next book then. Uh, let's shift gears here a little bit. Um, we talked about this a little bit. Is there a, a, a favorite uh, HPT or performance term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you see it being used uh, inappropriately and you want to uh, put your spin on that? Well, the term that's been annoying me most lately is the <laughs> term engagement. Um, and it's kind of more of an, a learning or a learning um, term. Most of the research on engagement is in work engagement. Most of the research in learning engagement is in higher ed and in K through 12. Um, and what I pulled together from reading the research is that it's not what people think it is. People tend to think of it as fun. Mm -hmm. And it's not fun. It's a engagement means some kind of cognitive, social, 
uh, emotional in, um, willingness to put in effort. Um, and so I think that many people have this wrong, that they think that engagement means it's fun, therefore I will want to keep doing it. I, I don't think that's it, because I don't know if you saw the, the video uh, of the... I did a, a, a debate in Berlin. Yes. Um, and... All learning should be fun. All learning should be fun. Ridiculous. <laughs> totally ridiculous because here's what we know in, in, from the research on building expertise. Once you get past the place where it's, you know a little bit, it's harder and harder to mm -hmm. learn. Um, and in fact, you, know, if you take sports um, or, or uh, music, which are the two big ones that have been studied with expertise, it's grueling. It becomes grueling to get past, to get to any level of expertise becomes grueling really fast. Who wants to spend four hours a day practicing the violin? Who wants to get up at 2 a.m. to go to the ice rink mm -hmm. um, to practice and fall and practice and fall? Um, you do it. At a certain point you get really good and it becomes fun again, mm -hmm. but in between there it's not fun. It's commitment. It's work. It's pain in the butt. And um, it's why so few people get to a place of expertise because it's true for pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, so engagement is a willingness to put forth continuing effort for a goal. Um, and it involves interest, sure. Mm -hmm. You have to be somewhat... It, you're not going to get up and go to the ice rink every morning at 3 a.m. and fall and hurt yourself um, if you're not interested. But it's interest is this much of it. It's effort. Um, and what keeps you going to do that? So that's my, my term I hate. And, <laughs> and it's not about fun. People think if we gamify mm -hmm. um, instruction, if we gamify work, um, yeah. Some stuff is just not fun. You got to do it anyway. I mean, isn't that part of the thing? Every one of us who has raised a child has been sorry. This isn't fun, but it's just what you got to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one of the things that's true of work. Um, I'm I'm not sure why people think learning has to be fun. I think it can be fun. Right. And often is fun. And for people who are gaining expertise and get to a certain level, even the dull stuff becomes fun because it's like when I'm sitting and reading research and it's like, oh, wow, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, super fun. But the 500 pages before that, before where I'm thinking, well, that doesn't say the same thing as this, and how are they different, and I'm writing notes. Not really fun, but there are elements of fun. I, so it, I'm not saying that it's not fun. I'm just saying sometimes it's not fun, and to keep learning and to, to perform at higher levels, it, some of it's just going to be hard, just mm -hmm. hard. Now, for some people, hard is fine. Right, if they're motivated to do that. Right. But if we have to make everything a game or make everything fun, we may miss some of the more important aspects of performance that, by their very nature, aren't fun. Right. I mean, it, it's, for example, um, one, one of the things in, in, in measuring performance and analyzing it is looking at handoffs. Mm -hmm. Well, those handoffs are almost always difficult. Um, I don't think we're going make to make them fun. Um, and yet, how do we, you know, how do we infuse people with the desire to do it better, to make it right? Um, I don't think we do that by making it fun. Um, I think there's other elements that may help, but but it's you know I'm I'm thinking of all the times I've found handoff issues, mm -hmm. and it's like well, one side says they need to give it to me like this. And the other side says, well, you need to be, know what to do with it when I give it to you like this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, those are not fun things, but those are um, 
in, in Rumler's terms, those are process issues. And it's like, can we redesign the process? You know, all and none of this is really all that much fun, but it has to be done. Right. <laughs> What's fun is the difference, the change. Um, you know, one, you asked me earlier about projects I've worked on. One of the most fun projects I've ever worked on. I use the word fun, but really it was it was a dream come true HPT project. So this, the, I have a healthcare background. So. This healthcare, big healthcare company that people would know um, says the people in customer service regularly give the wrong answers and we record everything. So if we record someone giving the wrong answer, then we have to pay for, for the price of that wrong answer. So somebody would call up and say, does insurance cover my orthotics? And um, they would say, yes, they do. Well, insurance didn't cover orthotics and therefore they had to pay for those orthotics. And so the question was, what do we need to do with our training so that people answer these questions well? And so the first thing I did is say, I need to sit with these folks for three, four days, just see what they do. Um, and ask questions and whatever. And it was, it was clear within two hours. Um, in order, so if somebody said, are my orthotics covered? First question, what is your name and what is your insurance number? So screen number one, here's the name and insurance number, here's the insurance they have. Um, and it, it's an 18 digit number. Um, and here's, the, here's who bought it, um, the, group, the group codes. They would copy those and go into another program and say, what, did, what, is that, what does that insurance have? And does that group have any riders that are different from all the others? And if so, open up those riders, read them. And it went on for five screens on a 14 inch CRT monitor. Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't have two open at the same time. You could had to scroll left to right to just read anything. And the answer was really clear. There's just no way to get a right answer here. Um, because by the time you get to screen five, where, where you're checking the next thing, um, you've forgotten where you, <laughs> I mean, and it has a lot to do with memory, right? So, um, so my first thing was, okay, can we get two or three people here, 22-inch um, um, flat panel monitors, and can we, can I work with them for a few days? Because right now I'm doing the prototyping thing. Mm -hmm. Can you know? Because those flat panel monitors are, are inexpensive, so and they were back then too. Um, and so I worked with those three people um, and tried to figure out what the best process would be. For, for them to open these screens and answer these questions. And it was clear, huge difference. Um, so then we rolled that out to five people and checked, checked their success against everyone else. Mm -hmm. And it was um, much higher. So long story short, in the course of, I don't know, six months, that one change um, save, went from I don't know, 33% wrong answers to 2% to wrong answers and, and a savings of, and because the, this company worked with the federal government, they had an officer mm -hmm. who quantified things, um, <coughs> saved $2.8 million um, by buying five CRT monitors. I mean, five wow. flat panels, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was the, like the, a dream, a dream HPT job. Mm -hmm. And I worked myself out of a job and it was done. <laughs> No need for changing training because the information on those pages changed every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was more it. of the process and how to and the tooling. Right, <clears throat> At the tools and the process, and we had a new process for how you answered those questions. Thank you. Let's go back to <clears throat> perhaps your early days in the world of evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or HBT, or whatever. Yeah, you choose to call it. I know you like HPT. I do too. Um, as we discussed previously, you have 
uh, people in the past that were influential to you in your ev practice of evidence-based uh, approaches. And you brought up several names here, so I'm going to just uh, hit you with them one at okay. a time. And you please just just tell us a little story about this person and uh, sure. and your interactions with them. But uh, Miriam, um, Miriam um, Neelan and I met online. I'm not exactly sure how we met, but it was within the last two years, three years. She came to a presentation I gave at Learning Technologies in London, and she didn't say hello to me. She said she was afraid to talk to me, um, which is like, why? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but she's very, very interested in evidence-based practice. And so I think she started talking to me on Twitter. And then we decided to meet on, on uh, Skype. Um, Miriam's 20-some uh, years younger than I am. And as direct as I am, and I feel like I've met my younger self, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've met a few times at conferences, and we talk all the time, and I, she's she's a fabulous instructional design manager, um, and very much interested in changing how we practice, um, and. Here, here's what I've left her with. It's like, like Miriam, I'm not going to be doing this for another 20 years. So um, when I'm done, I want you to just take over, okay? Because right now she's working in, in workplace learning and she's happy there. I said, one of these days I want you to just take this over because I'm not going to be here forever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I saw her in Berlin. Um, I left my coat. Um, in the Denver airport and she and I uh, went to stores together and she helped me buy a coat in Berlin. Uh, <laughs> two women shopping in Berlin together was fabulous. Um, and so um, she's one of my favorite people. She's a very strong advocate for doing the right thing in workplace learning and um, I think I'll know her the rest of my career and maybe beyond that. I. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. trying to get her to the United States. So. You guys did a, a, a conference presentation together uh, that I saw on video, and I can't remember what that was about. About, but. about why it's so <clears throat> why it's evidence based practice is so important, and some of the things that are going on in the world with training today um, that require it. Not just mm -hmm. it's not nice to do; it's needed. Yeah. You also mentioned uh, Will Tallheimer. Well, Will, Will and I have known each other a long time. Will's been doing evidence-based practice um, stuff um, for a long time, before, before I ever started doing it. And um, I've loved what he's written. I've loved what he's done. And um, just decided that I, I had my own twist on things. He's got his own twist. And so, so I jumped in. And he's been a fabulous supporter of what I'm doing and so actually Will and Miriam and I got together in Berlin last December, December 2018 and, and um, got lost looking for a restaurant together so we had a blast and then Miriam bailed us out because um, she speaks Dutch, that's her native language and it's close enough to German that she was able to get, to, to order for us. Mm -hmm. So we ended up in a part of town where there wasn't a bunch of tourists and mm -hmm. um, she ordered and, and and she actually ordered stuff we could eat instead of making <laughs> doing something funny like <laughs> like giving us something we wouldn't eat. Mm -hmm. so. Funny. Uh, you said that uh, Saul Carliner was also influential in your work. Hugely influential. I met Saul when I was in my 30s or 40s. I can't remember, but but um, I remember we were at a training um, conference, and I walked up. I walked up to him afterwards, like Miriam would have walked up to me, kind of like, "Can I talk to you, please?" And he has been. I was just starting a PhD, and um, he was not only so gracious, he helped me throughout. Um, he his writing has been hugely influential. Um, he there's things about Saul's writing that that 
if you haven't read his writing, you need to go find it. Number one, he's, he's an academic, but he understands real world practice and he tells it like it is. Um, and he'll be, he writes in your face. Um, he's just fabulous. And he comes from technical writing, so his love of, of clarity in writing has influenced me more than I can say. And to this day, um, one of my most important mentors. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you also told a little story to me uh, before we started the video about Tiagi. And he was involved in your uh, PhD. Right. So, so I did a, I did a, my dissertation on the role of uh, interaction between participants. And I built, using programming languages, I built something to, to, to allow people to interact on a page. You can do that in almost any tool now, but mm -hmm. back then you couldn't. And so um, he heard about it, and I can't remember whether we were friends before. I think we were. I think we'd seen each other at conferences and, and talked. Um, and I brought him out. Oh, I brought him to, to Colorado for, for the uh, Rocky Mountain or the Front Range chapter uh, of ISPI. And so he said, I'd like to, he said, do you need a, an outside advisor? And it's often helpful to have a, someone from the outside. And he was my outside advisor. So during my dissertation defense, um, because he's Tiagi and because he can get away with this, he would break in on a regular basis and ask esoteric questions. <laughs> um, and they were fabulous. And I, it, um, Tiagi, if, if you hear this, thank you. That was like, that was like comedy in the middle of a, of a dissertation defense. Um, and they were actually really good questions. Um, and thank God I was able to answer most of them. <laughs> <laughs> He is a treasure. For he sure. is a treasure and a total trip. <laughs> to say the least. Patty, thanks so much for agreeing to do this uh, video um, with me. And uh, the last thing I'd like to ask is do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience? In particular, young people may be entering the field in terms of, uh, you know, what, what advice would you give them related to uh, instructional design or performance improvement? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, the most important advice I can give is to care more about the people in the organization and the organization's mission um, than how pretty your stuff is. To go beyond, go beyond preparing content. This is something that's going on in our field right now that saddens me. That that. Um, we are mostly interested in how to prepare content. And it is not the least important thing, but it's not the most important thing, that the very first thing that people need to do is to understand what the business does and how different jobs impact it and what, the, what those tasks, you can't help at the job performance process and organizational level if you don't understand the the organization's work the processes that make that happen and and the jobs themselves it's the single most important thing we do when with my work with my training group the first thing anybody did when they worked in the training group was to spend time in in the the customer facing units. Um, I did that when I started. I worked, I worked in uh, urgent care and, and um, internal medicine and ear, nose, and throat just to understand what those, those customer-facing main output jobs, what they were about and what were the issues those people were facing. Um, and when we needed to grow our training department, we didn't grow it through the training department. We grew it through the operations folks who helped us figure out what was needed and helped us build it and then taught. Mm -hmm. um, because 
we didn't need to have 25 trainers. We needed, I think we had four, four people in the department plus two administration people. Um, everything else was done by people in the organization mm -hmm. um, because they knew it, not me. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what sense did it make to make it so that I knew it so that I could do it? Right. Um, they already knew it. And it, this goes back to something I said earlier. I can teach you how to do the most important parts of, of what I do. Um, probably, probably not everything, and it won't be perfect, and may not be organized perfectly, but our today's organizations simply don't have the time for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's got to get out there, and it's got to be good enough. And good enough is better than, not, than having nothing getting out there because there's a bottleneck in training. So the main thing I would say is, is know your organization. If, if your organization does X, learn everything you can about, about X, how to do X, how X is done, what is important, what are, what are the outcomes that are critical in that field. That's it. That's, that's, I mean, I could, have, I could go on for probably a year or two, but, <laughs> but the, most, if the very first thing is learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. Learn how to do your or what your organization does. Learn how it works. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for doing this video with me. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you.